Hello guys and welcome to the channel. In today's video, I want to show you one important video concerning the Labour Party presidential candidate Peter Obi that everybody should see. This video would give you a general understanding of why Peter Obi is running for president, why he ran as, and won as governor of Anambra State, and why he is now a presidential candidate in the Labour Party of Nigeria. The one thing that this video does so well it's, it gives you an understanding of why it starts. Because it's a common knowledge in Nigeria that most of the people who go into politics are typically power hungry people, people who want money, who want influence, and that is their primary driving force behind why they go for power. And this is not like to fall to those people as if they are some kind of strange creatures that are different from the rest of Nigerians. Because if you're a Nigerian, you probably are already aware of the fact that the average Nigerian man has this drive for power. I feel this is a, a maintain in general all over the world, but here in Nigeria, it's very, very close to home because we have this extreme competitive mindset. The keeping up with the Joneses here, it's on steroids because everybody has this mindset of I need to be stronger than my neighbor, I need to be more powerful than my neighbor, I need to be known in my area. When my name is spoken, it needs to breed fear. There are many ways to get to this position of power. You could either become a, uh, become a religious leader, which is one of the most powerful ways in this country. You could own a business and build it up to, to become somebody, a name that is worthy of repute which is one of the hardest ways to go, or you could join politics and play the dirty game. In Nigeria, politics is generally considered a dirty game. That is, it is so hard to believe that anybody who's a politician in Nigeria even has an inkling of going there for the common good or going there to try to make the lives of his people better. It is so rare that when a governor even manages to do a little bit of good during his entire say eight year tenure no matter how reckless he is if he just does a minuscule amount of good like clean up the city a little or make like, one or two roads in the center of the city he's hailed as like the best governor ever but Peter Obi's reign in uh, Anambra state was something that uh, drew attention from all over the world including uh, intergovernmental agencies for how well he ran that place and the best way to understand how he managed to accomplish that in a country like Nigeria, which is heavily known for political corruption and a very expensive and ineffective government, is to see this video and understand why he ran for governor and why he's running for president. I'm arriving slept in my village for one day. But something happened that made me to decide this is enough. And more than that, coincidentally, in 2000, in 1999, Professor B.C. Moose ran to be governor of Alabama State. In the primary, he lost. Professor B.C. I wasn't part of the election, wasn't the party, wasn't the party member. In 2001, they found out that the governor there wasn't doing what they expected. And a group of people approached him and said, you go, you plan to contest in 2003. Professor B.C. Moss turned to the group and said, I'm going to be seized in 2003. Nobody, is, no 60 year old can govern an Arab state. It's a very difficult state. You need a young man between 40 and 45 who is successful on his own, who can be able to battle all the problems. And he was asked, this happened in December 2001. And he was asked, as we said, this was actually December 2000, not 2001, sorry, that he should give them somebody. Eventually, ended up three names that they can approach to do the job. I didn't know all this discussion. It was not that I knew. I was just in a bank, as Fidelity Bank, which is mentioned now. 
ABC was doing soft health. And they invited me for a dinner. For me as a bank, I'm going to look for deposit. So I went to dinner. We finished talking. We never mentioned politics. We talked generally about Nigeria. My ideas about Nigeria and everything. And finished dinner and left for Lagos. He didn't tell me about politics. But in April, the people went back to him. He told them I have three candidates. One, P2, 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 P3, P2. Go and look for him. The people came from his office to my office and talked about politics. And I told them over, I used the word, over my dead body. At 14, I was chairman of the bank. I was the highest investor in the bank. I had interest in three banks where I was sitting on the board. I'm enjoying myself. I don't have anything. I fly every week. I go to London and come back first class. So why? What is this man talking? Go and get involved with this madness. That year, I had always done courses in various schools. Every year, I spend at least a week. Usually, it's two weeks, three weeks in school. I go to that's taking me to Harvard, to Columbia, Oxford, Cambridge. You know, I've been to all of them. That year, I was going to Kellogg Graduate School to do a program that was for six weeks. So in June that year, I went to Kellogg. The man who founded Kellogg Graduate School, Professor Dean Jacob, it was his last year. He founded the school in 1957. 2001 was the last year he turned and retired. And he took on what they call global economy. After one month of being in this class, this man never mentioned anything about Africa. A day before he concluded the lecture, everybody in Chicago was, the hall was full of top business leaders. A day before the final day, when he finished, I raised my hand and said, he never said anything about Africa. He said, you want to know about Africa? I said, yes. I paid $40,000 for this course. <laughs> and nothing was mentioned about the continent again. He said, I'll tell you about Africa tomorrow. The next day, which was the last day, he finished and said, you want to know about Africa? It's important I'll tell you this story. I said, yes. He said, there's nothing called African economy. He said, nobody belongs to Africa. I was so... He stopped to me and said, Peter, can you give me 10, 20 year plan of your country? You know the world was full. I was courageous enough. I said, yes. Even when I know there was not even tomorrow. Next one for one month. I said, yes. He said, that you can only do that when you have countries. If you have America, they have 10 year plan, 20 year plan, 30 year plan. You don't see it in African countries. That's why it's in my country. When I know it wasn't there. Because then, see, I haven't seen any car manufacturer talking about African specification. They have European specification, Gulf specification, Asia specification, American specification. You know why? Nobody plans in Africa. Say, so join me for lunch. So I joined him for lunch. After lunch, he said, let's take a walk by Lake Michigan. You know, if you know Kellogg Graduate School, it's on banks of Lake Michigan. The lake is like this, the school is like this. So they have long beach. So he said, let's take a walk in it. And we decided to take a walk. As we started the walk, he said to me, do you have any of your country's currency? This was 2001. The highest nomination was 109. I brought it out. David. He said, how much is it? I said, 100 naira. He bought a hundred dollars. He said to me, which of these two currencies do you prefer? I told him dollar. He said, why? I told him that it's hundred naira to one dollar. So his own is 10,000 naira. My own is hundred naira. So he said, I should keep his dollar and take my naira. So he gave me hundred dollars for hundred. Naira. 
After we walked a little while again, he turned around to me and said, Peter, you still have the money? I said, yes. He said, he brought it out again and said, which of these two currencies do you prefer? I told him, $100. He said, why? I told him about the rates. Again, it's okay, you keep it, I'll keep your money. He said, listen, he said that. He first proved to me that it costs more to bring the Naira than to bring the $100. Naira have multiple colors. I came back and took it on with Samusi and he agreed. Naira have multiple colors, but dollar is just green and white. He said to me, Peter, do you know why you believe in the dollar and you don't believe in Naira? I answered him again and said, no, it's the amount of faith you have in your country. You don't have faith in your country. It's not about it. You don't have faith in your country. The economy is driven by faith. Nothing else. Anybody who tells I've been teaching this for the best for several years now is faith. It's hope. That is what those plans I'm talking to is all about. 10 years, 20 years. It's hope. Nobody's sure what is going to happen in 10 years. But countries do give their people hope. But there's a sense of hopelessness in your place. That's why you prefer this currency. I've sat on various boards and in various committees and everything. And he went on and on to tell me about his life. And he convinced me that Japanese people keep their money in yen, not the rates. Chinese and Chinese yuan. Malaysians in China, Malaysia ringgit, Singapore is Singaporean dollars. He went on there, there was no euro. He sent me Italians, which their rate was worse. Keep it in Germans in Marx, everybody did. But the Africans don't keep it because they don't affect their continent. So they give it to the dollar and make the dollar stronger. Because they prefer to put their money here. And do it in Now he is the lecturer. He does S class. The wife is the lecturer, he does the lessons. The daughter is the lecturer, he does the lessons. The lecturers in your place don't drive such cars, don't live such cars. And they said to me, Can I ask you for a favor? Just to tell you, so I said, Yes. Say, go back to your country and participate in building public wealth. Public wealth enriches everybody. Individual wealth impoverishes everybody. All of you want to make private money. It does not be any charity. Well. If you made it to the end of the video, I congratulate you because it shows how committed you are to ensuring we pick the best person to guide us to progress in Nigeria. Do you think Kopi is the man of the other job or do you think any of the other candidates are more qualified? Let us know in the comments down below. If like me, you believe he's the man for the job, join the conversation in the comment section below as we try to convince others on why we think he's the best candidate right now. Thank you guys. Until next time.